Okay. Well, thank you all for coming today. And I'm not used to speaking with a mic. I have a booming voice, so I'm going to try to talk a little softer. I'm also used to moving around, but with the cameras, it's going to limit my movement. But you know, I'll try to stand still. I'll try. So you know, today, you know, the topic is ransomware. You know, I think for all of us that, you know, depending upon, well, let me survey. How many are in information technology security themselves? as practitioners. Okay. How many are in man management roles? Okay. And what's the rest of the people? You know, what, what are the areas? Okay, policy development, okay. okay. So ransomware is somewhat specific. However, the thing that you know, I, I want to point out is Ransomware is just another form of malware. I gotta figure out how to use the clicker without advancing too far. There we go. So what is ransomware? So for the purposes of you know, this presentation, you know, I wanna talk about ransomware that encrypts individual files, ransomware that encrypts the whole, the entire hard drive, and then also ransomware in the respect of there's some software or malware out there that will actually move or exfiltrate the data off your system, and other, actually it doesn't move it off the system, but it moves the data to the recycling bin or another location and hides it. So there is a, an incident that I was just on in the last week in which you know, the customer didn't know why a number of their directories had changed to basically a GUID format on their file share. And they were trying to understand what had happened. In the process, we found a piece of malware. That malware was designed to map out you know, the open shares and map shares, to identify the file locations and folders, to rename the folders, and then to move the data to the recycle bin. As it went through the process, it also created a shortcut, an LNK or a link file, and placed it into the folder, which would be used later to map the location in the recycle bin in order to pull the data back out once a ransom was paid. So we assume, because a ransom, the malware didn't fully execute, and then also a ransom note was not received. But in that case, the command and control servers where they would have communicated with, it was hard-coded into you know, the drop file and the executable, but the communication never took place. So in that case, we really don't know if it was just a lack of permissions that the user had on the server, or if it was because the command and control servers had been taken down, but there was no communication with them. So for this purposes, it can be any of them. It can be encrypting data or extorting, you know, for the, you know, to give the data back to you. Where's the impact? You know, primarily Windows-based systems are the targets. You know, with that, you know, it could be application servers, it can be file shares, your workstations, laptops, or other devices that are out there. And anything that runs on those systems. So when I hear conversations about SCADA and ICS, if those applications or the human management interface you know, to the SCADA systems are on an internet accessible you know, system, you face that a ransomware attack or infection could happen on those systems too. And I hear so many people saying, oh no, it's on a segregated system and it doesn't have internet access. However, then I start asking the question, how do you update the software? Oh, well, it goes through this other server and then it goes out to the internet. I'm like, okay, so it does have internet access. Then the follow-on question is, do the administrators, do they get out onto their social media or do they check their email on the same servers that they're you know, when they're managing, I mean, they're in their administrative function. So, and then quite often the answer is, well, yes, I mean, they get bored. So part of this will go to any application that is connected to the internet, you know, whether it's a data store, whether it's, you know, payment card information, 
medical records or anything could be impacted with ransomware. But the larger conversation really goes to malware and other things that will drop the ransomware in the end. So it's prevalent and profitable, so it continues. And if you pay the ransom, you're going to give the incentive to the bad actors to continue. Right now, they're getting so much money that they are continuing in the practice. So if you try to break the cycle, not pay, and prepare in advance, then it's gonna make it less attractive for them to target you. And then also, if you prepare in advance, it minimizes having to pay. Now I say minimizes because I hear organizations say, we will never pay. And then you find there's times where they did pay. So, you know, so work towards a plan of resiliency and bouncing back, reducing the risks in your environment, and then work towards following best practices. And sometimes, I mean, the conversation always goes after an incident occurs or a massive in incident occurs is, oh yeah, we did, yeah, we update things. But then you find out that they had unsupported operating systems, they didn't patch their third-party applications, and there are a number of other things in their environment that they didn't follow. So whether it's the SANS 20 or you know, NIST standards, you know, it's following, having good security practices in place, following best security practices, which you know, you're fighting a significant fight because while the topic is whether or not to pay for ransomware, you're really fighting a number of other things because the ransomware doesn't just drop on your system. There has to be a downloader or a dropper typically to put it onto your system. So you have to be looking before the ransomware to fight it. And if you're fighting the droppers and the downloaders, you're also fighting other forms of malware, you're fighting other forms of crimeware, and you're fighting the larger picture. So while it's to pay or not to pay, really it's a conversation about protecting yourself, mitigating risk, reducing risks. You know, I think it's 1.3 million ransomware samples were you know, submitted by the end of quarter two. So that tells you how many different you know, files are being processed and reviewed. Now many of those are from the same families, they're just variants. So they keep switching things up to get through the sensors, to get through the security applications. So there's many different types. I mean, you know, Loki and Tesla and a number of others were very prevalent, prevalent in the news in the beginning of the year. And once again, yeah, I think it was around 1.2, 1.3 million you know, samples that are out there. The number of, I'm trying to click, click. Wonderful technology. So all of a sudden it'll probably go through about five slides, so. <laughs> so to look at, you know, going back to the conversation on, it's profitable. But what makes it profitable besides people paying it? It's the ability to pay. So my former career was in law enforcement and investigating cyber crimes, which tied into many of the payments. When you look at before 2009, eGold was prevalent. eGold was a company where you could, you know, it was electronic you know, funds, you know, different than BitGold, but still the same sort of thing. You're exchanging money, it had a gold standard but they were convicted and put out of business in 2009. In 2009, Bitcoin also was invented and you know, came into the market. It took a few years before it really ca caught on. So in the meantime, you know, there were still payment mechanisms for extortionware, fake AV, ransomware out there. Money Pack was a big one in which all you had to do is you know, if it came up on the screen with your picture saying you've been doing bad things or you know, whatever, you know, pay us this money, you went down to, it was like $200 and it moved up to $500 you know, at the prime. And you'd go down to whatever the retail store was, you'd buy a card for that money value, you'd scratch it off and it'd give you a code which you would plug into the screen for the ransom or the extortion and then once you paid it, it would unlock your system and then allow you access to your files. When we were conducting investigations on the law enforcement side, we would find out that 
a lot of the different scams that were out there had what we call money mules. They would be people who were paid a percentage of the collection, I mean of the money that they collected, and they would go out to convenience stores or banks and they would cash you know, these you know, cards out or cash the funds out related to these accounts and then they would pay on a portion of those monies to other bad actors and it basically laundered the money from the extortion. Well, a lot of the people who were doing this were getting caught because of video cams and everything in the stores. So it wasn't that, I mean, the anonymity wasn't there. With Bitcoin, there's a greater level of anonymity. So that helped really explode the growth and the profit margin related to the ransomware. So basically, I mean, you'll see, you know, 2013 and then in 2016, the explosion of growth. See, so observations in early 2016 from McAfee Labs, and you know, it's I say McAfee Labs, but if you look at the other vendors, you're going to see similar, you know, releases of information, and it's it's not it's just what has occurred. So ransomware is a service. If you didn't know how to write it, you could go out and pay somebody to do it for you. You know, source code. You could go out and you could buy the source code. I'm not buy. You could download it from GitHub or wherever else and then you could do it yourself. It didn't take the knowledge of how to write the code, it was just either finding it, which was available, or paying somebody to do it for you. Uh, targeted ransomware campaign. So we were involved, not that I can disclose hospital names, but a number of hospitals in which they were specifically targeted, they were hacked into, and the malware, the ransomware specifically, was placed on their system by the hackers, and then they used, uh, I guess I'll, I was gonna say that for later, but they actually used the same inst I mean, software installation programs or you know, ones that are available to push the malware out on the system. They used their domain controllers in order to facilitate the installation of the malware across the domains. So there's a number of sophisticated people out there, they would target them and then they'd demand the ransomware there was a number of hospitals that paid. But over time, they stopped paying, or, well, the ones that I know, because they started to do some of the preventive measures that were necessary and took some of the preparation measures that were necessary in order to have the resiliency to bounce back and not pay. Um, ransomware encrypting master boot record or the whole disk encryption you know, was out there, but the MBR specifically, Apple hit you know, was hit with ransomware. It was short-lived. Uh, there was a patch that came out and took care of it. But the thing that, while people say Apple systems, you know, really aren't targeted, the one thing that I did notice is if there was an open share or a map share to a data store on an Apple system that still, you know, posed a risk if it was coming from, you know, Windows-based system. So if it could map to a location, still it could encrypt files out there. So just because the OS may have been safe or safer, doesn't mean that files on the system could not be encrypted themselves. So threat defense life cycle. You know, what are we going to do? You know, protection, you know, correction, you know, detection. You know, you're trying to mitigate the risk, you know, avoid the risk to begin with, reduce your threat landscape, you know, reducing the risk, and then once it occurs, to mitigate it. So, it's just a process and a methodology. I mean, it really has to be something that you adopt and do full time because you can't just all of a sudden start these things in the midst of an outbreak. So you have to think about it now. And with you know, everything that I heard from the state legislature yesterday or legislators is that planning must take place, budgeting may take, uh, is going on. So there's support now. So, you know, take that and ride the wave. I mean, it, it, it is the present. So this is how I like to dis discuss the challenges that you're going to face, is access versus security. So you're always going to run into the end user. Access, they're happy. Security, they're not so much. You know, it's user impact. And I've seen organizations that have refused to implement security because 
they were making end users unhappy. Now it's like, wait a second. If you have payment card information, you have you know, healthcare information, you have all these things, is it really the making the end user happy? I mean, there, there's a certain level of you have to make the system as easy as you can so they can conduct business, but if they want to go out to social media, if they want to do other things that are posing risks to the environment, if they want to use programs that aren't going through your change control board, you need to make sure that there's always a balance towards protecting the data. Some organizations do not have that attitude. They are like, hey, we can't stand all the surveys coming in saying we're doing a bad job because we're you know, securing the system, so we would rather them be happy. Well, then they have incidents, and then they pay someone like me or other organizations to come in and deal with it. So, and even in the midst of the engagement, I mean, the consulting engagement, sometimes companies won't do, won't implement security measures that would protect themselves better because they're still stuck with, they want to keep their internal customer happy. Yes, sir? Why does that surprise you? Well, it, it surprises me because I'm an optimist. I, I, I'm hoping that they will learn, but there, there's some, and once again, I can't go into large, I mean, to the names of the customers, but there are some very large customers that I've had that I am very surprised because of the type of data that they are entrusted with or that they control. Right, and I didn't, I'm sorry, I didn't mean more than surprised that particular scenario. Why are you surprised when the user impact is put above data protection? Because if the end users are happy and they're getting all these wonderful surveys and you're saying they're doing a great job, that's the, at least in my experience as I've watched as these things happen, that's the target lines of the last thing. Oh yeah. So, so if well, there, there is a cost of doing business, but also what is that cost? So if you're entrusted with healthcare data, if you're entrusted with PCI data, or not entrusted with, you, there are regulatory requirements related to the data. So there, there's a certain point in which keeping your employees happy, it really should be outweighed by the protection of the data. So compliance to the regulatory requirements should trump that. Now, there should be reasonableness, but not so much to the side of being happy and open to access that it trumps all of the you know, protections that could be put out there. Uh, research environments, uh, universities. Back in, yeah, I won't place a, the date on my age, but there were, uh, NASA specifically, had a number of researchers that wanted to share data with universities. And they were wide open to sharing information related to the space program. They also had things wide open which allowed for access to the satellite data and satellite control. And there were some people who hacked into the systems and had access to it. Not sure exactly what they could do. So at a certain point in time, keeping people happy, you know, having research have access should be countered and should not be allowed, so. So the threat vectors, you know, what are they? I mean, there's many popular types of ransomware we discussed earlier, Loki, Loki, depending how you want to say it, uh, Tesla Crip, and all of these things, maybe not, I mean, the ransomware too exploits weaknesses on your systems, but there's going to be downloaders, there are going to be droppers, there are going to be other things that really facilitate the installation of the malware and ransomware. And it's the ransomware, typically the dropper, I, well, I'll say typically based on experience, that when the droppers are loading or downloaders are bringing on malware to your system, the people who are managing those servers also get paid for doing different types of things. So you may get, at the same time that you're getting ransomware, you may get crimeware. There for a while, I don't know if you know, Pink Slip Bot, ActBot, QBot, it had a few different names. It was a form, I mean, it was big, really came out, it didn't come out the end of the year. It's about 10 years old. It was re, there was a re-release of it in about November or December of 2015. With that, 
At the same time, Pink Slip Bot, which was designed to steal logons and passwords, I mean, it was a banking theft crimeware package. At the same time, systems were being hit with Tesla script and then also Locky. So if they would have protected themselves and updated third-party applications and not had legacy operating systems running, which were unsupported, they would have been in a better defensive posture. So with that, you, it's a wider conversation than just ransomware. So compromised websites, you know, the, a lot of times it'll be either be watering holes where they know you're gonna go, or actually just sites that they figure mass people will go to. Um, social media sites, the many organizations let their employees go out to social media, so you could put up this, the firewalls, you can put up all these protections, you can do the email scanning, the web filtering, everything, but when you let the employees use their own social media or use their own devices, they can come right through and also drop program, not themselves drop the you know, malicious programs on, but because that has been open, it's an opening into the security of the system, it can be used for you know, a way in which for the malware to be installed. Um, many of the mass spam, oh, Uncategorized websites, that's also going to be, that's an area that, you know, some people do not, or organizations do not want to block uncategorized websites because they don't want to get all the complaints that I can't go to this site, I can't go to that site, but they're not that popular of sites, and if they're a legitimate site or a site that you wish to let in, then you can still open them up so the users can go to. But many of the malware sites, you know, are uncategorized. I mean, they're throwing up these sites right and left, in order to get through your defenses. So I had a customer about a week ago who says, well, what do you think? Should we you know, block them or stop you know, access? And they just got hit by a ransomware attack. So I'm like, well, what are you protecting? You know, why are you letting people go to these sites? And theirs was an access, you know, allowing access to the sites for their employees. They wanted to keep the employees happy, but after this incident, they realized that maybe it's time to block the uncategorized sites. Um, mass campaigns of email, you have targeted spams, it can either be directly to your organization or it can just be, you know, that they're going through a library, uh, you know, a dictionary generator and sending out mass spam campaigns and you just happen to get hit by a commodity attack. Hack and attack, the SAMAS, SAMHSA, SAMSAM is the, the malware, the ransomware that specifically went to the, I mean, was you know, impacted the hospitals where they hacked into the systems. On that, you know, the recommendations were to go through and reset, you know, the Kerberos certificates twice and to also reset all the passwords, which, you know, organizations still, going back to the conversation of, you know, why does that surprise you or does it surprise you, you know, for that they're like, well, you know, we'll, it's a lot of work, you know, should we do it? When should we do it? That was another organization is they waited three months to reset the Kerberos certificates and passwords because they only wanted to do it once, but they had been impacted severely by the first incident. For me, it was way too long to wait. So, system, I mean, third-party vendor or unmanaged systems on your network, I'm sure nobody has that. You know, when a vendor comes in and says, hey, I want internet access, and they hook into your switch or they hook into the inside of your network, and they don't have the security, they're not a managed endpoint, you know, you should be concerned immediately. When users are like, you know, I wanna hook my smart TV in, or I wanna hook my light bulbs in, because I wanna, you know, update, you know, the firmware on my light bulbs, uh, internet of things, you know, there's so many devices out there that are threats to your environment, and it's those unmanaged systems that you really have to pay attention to, you have to be concerned with, and that could be as simple as printers, you look at the age of the printers and some of the vulnerabilities are out there. You look at voice over IP systems. There was a client there where I was at and they had a voice over IP system running on a 2003 server. On the 2003 server, the company refused to put any virus scanning software on it or any security patches because they didn't want to impact the phone system. Hello, it was connected to their main network. It was infected with Pink Slip Bot, and it was a carrier, and I mean, it was spreading 
the malware throughout their environment so they could clean every managed endpoint and every system that they own. But until they track down, you know, we worked to track down the IP address and the devices to get it clean, but had to clean those devices too. So third party systems, unmanaged system, vendor systems, employee systems. Had another case in which a public school system contacted us and said, we have ransomware on our system. The only thing that they had was antivirus, and it wasn't centrally managed. So luckily, it wasn't spreading when we got there, but I think what happened was either a teacher, a student, or a vendor walked in with the system, connected it to the network, started to do whatever they wanted to do. They had an infected system. They probably realized at the time that it was infected because bad things were happening, took it off, put it into their bag, and walked away. So these are the types of things that you have to concern yourself with. Managing not only your assets, but other assets that may be on your network that will help you protect your overall environment. Um, the DMZ, you know, there is a situation in which there were computers placed into the DMZ that had internet access, and they also had a direct line back to the domain controllers. It was the attack vector that they used to get in and then start to spread malware. I mean, they hacked in, and then they started to spread the malware on the inside of the system. So understanding your DMZs, understanding your jump systems. If you have jump systems going through your network that have internet access, understanding it all. You know, reducing your threat scape. And you know, don't tell the salespeople I'm saying this, but no matter what your security product is, and there's a number of them out there, you know, just disregard the top part. It's trying to reduce the threat scape as it moves into your environment. So if you can do web filtering to block out extensions of files or threats before they get in, and then whether it's real-time behavioral analysis, you know, try to identify the threats as they move in to get to a point where it's filtered, where if you have sandboxing technology, in order to further screen it and remove the threats. You're trying to reduce it before it gets into your environment. And there's a whole list of extensions of documents you know, we'll go with .exe and some of the common ones, you know, SCR, .zips. Those may be documents that you want to block in total, quarantine, or at least put restrictions on who has the ability to, you know, have access to them. Or they have to have them released in order to look at them. But you want to minimize your threatscape of those files that are coming into your environment. And if you can automatically identify that they're malicious, you want to stop that at you know, the opening into your environment. And then there's also, you know, on the endpoint side, there's endpoint products that can further you know, screen out and have plugins into your Outlook that can further screen from there. So it's reducing the threat scape into your environment. So be ready and prepare. Incidents are going to happen. You know, you said cost of doing business. You know, it is part of doing business. I mean, you just have to be ready for it. It's, it's not a question of if it's going to happen. It's when it's going to happen. Everybody's impacted with it. You come up with you know, a better way to defend. The bad guys, it's a full-time business. They're trying to learn how to circumvent. So they're, they're packing files, executables. They're using obfuscation and code. So when it comes through, your scanners can't see what it is. And you don't see what it is until it hits the endpoint and then it reaches out. So there are the bulk ways to Block the data, you know, that funnel is reducing your risk, but some of the reduction of risk isn't until it hits the endpoint. So you have to have a managed endpoint you know, solution. But more importantly, have a plan. I mean, all the, the conferences, this is great. You guys are developing plans, you're getting training, and you're also focusing on which, the delta between where you're prepared and what you need to do. So this is outstanding, but put it, put it into writing. I mean, if it's, you know, if you have a plan, improve the plan. If you don't have a plan for an individual you know, scenario or event, modify your process and flow, your playbook, update it. And no, no matter which security product you own, if you don't know how to leverage what you have, it's not going to provide you the benefit that you hope for. 
So if you're, you're saying, wow, they say it will work, but it doesn't work, call the customer support line. Read the documentation. Push for training. You know, whatever, I mean, whatever product it is. You just have to understand it because if you're not happy with one product and you move to another product that you're still not understanding, you're never going to fix the problem. So understand it, leverage it, understand the deltas of what you don't have, and then move towards you know, maybe another solution that does what you need. But first of all, understand how to leverage what you own. And then log and report events. I was out on a site and they're like, oh yeah, we didn't alert on the 350 changes of the folders that occurred within 60 seconds. Automated triggers. I mean, if you have things going on in your environment, have the automated triggers in place so you get the alert. And not only, okay, one is the detection part, but if it's detecting it, make sure you have an alert based off the detection. Because they're like, oh yeah, we detected that with the software. I'm like, great, where's, where's your notification that it happened? And if they're not correct, we just turned it on. So had they turned it on, they would have had notification the same day or you know, minutes later after all the changes. The way in which they knew that the changes of the folders occurred was because the end users contacted the security department to say, hey, there's strange names on all of our folders now. Not the best way to learn about an incident. So make sure that the logging goes to your centralized, so whether you have a SIM, an aggregation point, you know, also that you have groups set up that the notifications goes, are sent to the appropriate groups. So we'll go through some of just the basic things to do. And the, the, this is not rocket science. This is just things that many organizations do not do. So having open shares and mapped shares is a great thing to share information. I will admit to that. However, it is also a great way for ransomware and other crimeware to rapidly spread through your environment. So the C dollar sign, the admin dollar sign, do you need it? If you don't, either reduce access to it or eliminate it. Mapped shares, does everybody need them? You know, I mean, unauthenticated access to mapped shares? Maybe employ some authentication or reduce, you know, the number of mapped shares that you have. Definitely segregate your data. Don't put it all in one place. Um, Microsoft Office macros. If you have a macro virus, it gets onto your system and automatically runs, it will unpack or download malware onto your system and work towards you know, downloading further malicious programs on, or maybe it has it embedded into the macro itself so it can just start running and not even need the access to the internet. With that, you can disable that function, and we go back to an access versus security function. I've had organizations say, well, we have this group that really needs it, and we're gonna make them unhappy if they don't have it. Well, if you have a group of 10 people, and you have 3,500 or 5,000 people in your organization, does everybody need to have it automatically enabled? Maybe reduce it to the people that you have to. Not really that you have to, maybe they have to click on something to enable it, but also, user education plays a part in this is when something pops up on someone and once they receive an email and it tells them to enable you know, the word macro function in the email, I mean the download, maybe they shouldn't be doing it, especially if they don't know who the email's from. Just saying. Um, Conversation before, block and filter email and attachments based on known threats or you know, executable, zips, you know, whatever they may be. Um, RDP, remote desktop. If you don't need it in your environment, why do you have it and why do you let everybody do it? Once again, if you can limit it to those people who need it, maybe on the admin side, you know, or re only allow it at times that they need it. I mean, some organizations live, live with it, but not every user needs it. They just need to, you need to block things that users don't need. Education, talked about that. 
antivirus protection. There's organizations that have antivirus protection on their endpoints and servers, but they don't update it. They don't update the signatures. They don't even have it running sometimes because they don't want to inconvenience the end users. So make sure it's updated, make sure it's running. And if you only update your antivirus for people who are on the inside of the network, you have to make sure people come in to update it. And you have to have the policies in place to enforce that. Because there are people or organizations that have employees that never update or rarely update their antivirus signatures, which leaves everybody at risk. And you just need to have a couple people at risk to threaten the rest of your organization. You hear backup, 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 backup everything. Essential, essential. However, there's some caveats to it. So, you know, a small organization, not the state, but still there could be some applications where you're backing up to removable media, you know, tape drives. People make fun of me for bringing up tape drives, but once it's on a tape drive, it may be slow to restore, depending, but it's not gonna be accessible like a hard drive or an attached drive is. Um, USB media, you know, make sure you're disconnecting it. So if you back up, I, I had another client that they, he backed up all of his information to the USB drive and he had it all backed up and he was so proud of it. But when he got hit with the ransomware, it encrypted everything on his USB drive. So it really did him no good. So cloud storage, if, it's, if you have mapping to your cloud storage and it finds the mapped location, it's encrypted too. So maybe you need a third party application or some disconnect between the two in order to protect it. Or if you can afford the offsite storage, make sure that it's being backed up on a regular basis. You know, many companies have it backed up within 24 hours. So if you get hit with something, you only have the delta in time to the point of the infection to the last backup. But ensure that you have some backup solution and it's not always attached and always at threat by the ransomware, uh, and, and backups. And when I say threat to the ransomware, ransomware is designed, many forms of it, to go out to seek and destroy your backups. So a backup can be a VM, it can be a traditional backup utility, uh, your volume shadow copies, there's all sorts of different backups. And in one customer, it sought out, destroyed the backups, and it destroyed the whole folder structure associated with it, so it could not be recovered. Resiliency, they had a back, an off-site backup, so they were only down to the last backup within 24 hours. Still caused them a significant amount of harm, but not as much as paying the ransom to the bad actors. Robust antivirus software, whatever you have. You know, consider the heuristic scanning, you know, memory and high risk areas, make sure you're scanning those. Some, uh, well, it has to be enabled, but you, know, you wanna make sure that you're looking at the high risk areas, the, the memory, the DLLs, you know, you know, registry linked files. You, you need to make sure those are being scanned. For hard drives, some organizations are just you know, on demand scanning. However, there's, if there's a piece of malicious code that's been sitting out there for a while, that hasn't been touched, you could have a malicious you know, executable still on your system that has not been touched but still sits out there. If there's some sort of a persistence mechanism within you know, the registry, you know, it, it'll wait until that time to try to call out to it. And if you don't have the antivirus configured properly, you, know, you can continue to infect your system or it may even try to download it over the web for an updated version because they do like to update their code. They don't like, to, they don't like old code. Um, let's see what else. If you have a rogue or unknown process running on your system and you feel that it's a threat, disconnect it. I mean, so it's not causing an impact. But I say that, but there have been organizations that says, it's our domain controller. You know, it's all of our domain controllers. Well, you have to do some research. You have to do some thought. You have to have the people who are trained to even look at these things. So. You may not be able to disable something, but you should immediately pay attention to it and understand if it's something, you know, if something more extensive is happening. So the question before was like Sony, you know, something like this, if something's happening, you don't know what's going on, it's a time to 
dig deeper into it. So it may be nothing, but it could be something significant. Yeah, keeping everything up to date. Once again, this is not rocket science. This is just basic things, but many organizations don't do it because you know browsers are like, well, if we um, update our browsers, we're going, we won't be able to use certain applications or gain access to information on this that we need access to. So there's choices that are made. But if your organizations decide not to update third-party applications or other high-risk applications, somebody should take acceptance of that risk. The risk should be identified, and the risk should be accepted. And whether or not that person has the ability to accept it, sometimes people say, oh, yeah, I'll accept that. But are they in a position, really, where they have the authority to accept it? So there has to be a balance of that. Some of these, um, oh, trust no one, literally. So in one case, one of the ransomware victims was the CEO of the company. And he intimidated his employees so much on the IT side that they're like, okay, let's disable, we gotta get this program installed right away. So they disabled the security functions, the access protection rules. And because they disabled it, at the time after you know, they installed the software for them, they forgot to re-enable it. So, his was one of the systems that was impacted. But, you know, whether it's employees going out to social media, whether it's emails coming in seemingly from someone you know, but the content just doesn't seem right, be suspect of it. This, this, some of this goes with beyond the security applications and goes to employee education, employee training, you know, just employee awareness. BYOD policies, you know, people who can bring in their thumb drives from home. You can have all this wonderful security on your systems, but if you have a thumb drive that has a worm on it, and you're transmitting, I mean, you're basically walking code back and forth from a home system into the environment, and it keeps infecting the system, or it never stops being infected because they're walking it back and forth, you can also have all this wonderful protection that keeps the data from going out of your environment. You can have the firewalls, you can block have the reputation checking, all these things. But when they walk in with that thumb drive, pull it in, and it downloads to the thumb drive, they go home, and then it uploads someplace else, those BYOD policies are the ones that are gonna save you. You know, don't let people have, I'm plug in whatever they want to into your networks. It's a threat. Show file extensions. There's many executables and other types of programs out there that if you're blocking, showing the full file extensions, you may not even, they, they wouldn't be aware that they're actually running an executable on their system. So, you know, you know show it. Bring things into the light. You know, the cockroaches spread when you turn on the lights. Um, let's see. Talked about physically disconnecting the systems, but there's also ways in which to virtually disconnect it whether it's at a switch, or if you have a host-based um, intrusion protection system. If you have the ability to put firewalls onto your endpoints, you can create a custom policy that will block it. So during an incident, one of the things that I do is, if our customers own, and, and I, I deal with McAfee clients just because, you know, you know, they primarily, I mean, maybe not primary call us, but you know, a lot of them do, so I talk about using the HIPs, you know, host-based intrusion protection, to create a firewall that isolates the system from the rest of the network. And at the same time, you can still communicate with the other products, the antivirus programs, to clean it up or attempt to clean it at the same time. So no matter who the vendor is, it doesn't have to be McAfee, it could be whatever, if you own the ability to have a host-based firewall, why not consider to use it during an outbreak. I effectively use it with clients all the time to isolate those systems, to get them cleaned, or to remove them permanently from the network. Depends. Um, let's see. Real-time scanning. Make sure your on-demand scanning is on. During an incident, I push for daily scans, full scans. I guess I'm coming up to the end. Um, of the 
the workstations and servers. Servers, you can't always do it because you may impact, I mean, you may degrade the you know, performance of the servers, but you have to be careful about what you're doing. But if you're not scanning them whatsoever, you, know, you could have threats on there. But definitely memory scans, step them up. I recommend three times a day during an outbreak. You know, full scans, any system that you can do a full scan on. You know, with the software these days, a lot of it will throttle down when someone's using the computer, but it'll keep scanning till the end, so there's not a degradation of the performance. But even if there is a degradation of the performance, if you have an outbreak on your system, access versus security. Do you want to have complaints that you know, they have slow time, or do you want to find out that your data has been pushed to an offsite and somebody else's, you know, someone's published it on Pastebin? Um, access control rules. At the end of the presentation, I have a number. I mean, you can go out to um, you know, the McAfee site, and there's threat reports that you can download for specific malware. You can also look up access control rules for ransomware. So you can block on your systems if there are locations in which executables shouldn't run. So let's say um, the root of your, your hard drive, you know, C, you know, you know, typically called you know, the C drive. You can block executables from running there. You can go to the temp, temp folder and block executables from running there. You may or may not, depending upon what your needs are in your system. But if it's a location that doesn't typically or shouldn't run, an executable shouldn't run from, block it. And specific to different forms of malware and ransomware, there are certain rules that you can put in that is very specific to the threat and will not or will reduce the chance of impacting you know, your other processes. Um, let's see. You know, use your, oh, at, after you have an incident, you know, I don't know if you use Microsoft, SCCM, what security products you have, but there's gonna be remnants on the system, whether in the registry or remnant files, or I mean actually files that are not malicious or detected by the antivirus programs, but still, you may not want them on your system. So using SCCM, using, you know, McAfee has MAR and other things, I mean, programs out there to clean up your system, you can clean, that, clean up the remnants of these. And you want to get, you want to remove from the registry, if you can, you know, the, the persistence mechanisms or call-out features just to clean it up. And then, you know, the remediation at the end. You know, if you have a ransomware impacted system, do you really want to put it back into your production environment? Or do you just want to get rid of it? Everybody has a different answer to that, especially, you know, they may say, well, we can't do it, it's so unique, but, you know, you have to weigh the risks. Somebody has to accept the risks. And then, have you done enough to prepare? I don't know. I mean, we're always, they're, they're, you build a better mousetrap, they build a better mouse, so. Here are the white papers and other information that I mentioned before. There's a significant number of other things out there. I mean, other articles, but you know, you can go out to these sites. Uh, there's low-hanging fruits, top five easiest ways to hack or get hacked. Think like a hacker, six steps towards better security. You know, when minutes count, you know, things to do. And the top one, combating ransomware. It has a number of access protection rules and things that you can use to block the spread of ransomware. So hopefully you take away something positive from you know, the presentation today and thank you for having me.